Folks at home, welcome back to the Crimson Oak Pond, and if you're new to this series, we built this five acre pond over the past year, and it took us several months to get all of the dirt excavated, and we had to bring in several truckloads of clay, and we also built an island, a dock, and got all the structure in place, and then it took a couple of months to get it full of water. After that, we stocked it with a bunch of bait fish, including bluegills and threadfin shad, and not long after that, we stocked it with these little two inch aggressive bass. And we're going to be giving you an update on them here in just a minute and showing you how big they've gotten. But before we get into that, a quick update on the weather. So a winter storm swept across the country last week, and it's rare that we get below freezing temps here in South Alabama. But when we do, strange things happen in nature. So the cold weather kicked off the whitetail rut. This is that time of year where the bucks act a little crazy. But more importantly, if these below freezing temps hang around for more than a week, we could have a big fish kill. So let's start off with an update at the ponds. All right out here at Cedar Falls and somehow we did not freeze over out here in the pond, most likely because we got so much moving water here with the waterfall and then all the research pumps that pump water throughout the pond. But I'm betting that the water temp got down into the low 40s, high 30s last night. Aquascape actually gave us a smart thermometer. Let's go check it out. I was right, 42.8 degrees. Now the real question is, will the tilapia survive out there with water temps this cold. So while I was adding a temperature sensor to the five acre pond, the feeder went off and I was kind of surprised to see the fish up there actively feeding because the bluegills and bass get pretty lethargic in cold water and most pond owners just turn the feeders off. Oh, that's trout. Look how long and slender their bodies are. That's rainbow trout. Yeah, it sure is. So the trout are out here thriving in this cooler weather. <laughs> All right, I let this sit for a minute and the pond temp is 46.7. So that's definitely gonna be a problem if it stays like that for the next couple of days because tilapia can only survive in about 50 to 52 degrees. Anything cooler than that over a few days, they're not gonna make it. We had another freeze last night. Temps got down to about 24 and we're finally starting to see the tilapia show up dead. Look at there, we got one cruising right there just barely moving along you can see that white little shadow so we're actually supposed to start getting some warmer weather over the next few days but man that's a pretty big tilapia right there got another albino guy hanging out right here by the dock man that is a big guy right there look at how wide he is that thing is for sure five pounds <laughs> But you can see, that's what they're doing to survive, sitting right up here in the shallow water. So after the second night of freezing temps, I started seeing dozens of floating tilapia. But I want to start off by saying that this is not necessarily a bad thing. So outside of Florida and maybe California, almost every other body of water in the U.S. is going to dip down below 50 degrees. And as you can see, the tilapia can't survive. But this is somewhat a way of nature correcting itself. So as you've seen in the pond this past year, tilapia are prolific spawners and will spawn multiple times a week throughout the summer and fall. And this can obviously lead to overpopulation issues. And in some states, it's illegal to stock tilapia out of fears of them taking over the body of water. So while it's unfortunate that these fish have to die and we'll have to restock them each year, it's nature's way of keeping things in check. And I've also done some research that tilapia can have a negative effect on the largemouth bass spawn because they tend to spawn in the same areas and that'll create extra stress so we'll be watching the pond over the next few days to see if any of them survive, but right now it's not looking good. So while the storm was unfortunate for the tilapia, it was a blessing for others, and you wouldn't believe the amount of wildlife that show up to a pond when there's an easy meal. We even had new bald eagles show up that we've never seen. You can see this one's still a juvenile and hasn't developed that fully white head yet. But one of my favorite things to watch was those pesky blue herons. <laughs> and you can see by the look on his face, he's like, this is almost too good to be true. But most of the tilapia fed on algae throughout the year, and some got up to around four to five pounds. And as you can see, those bigger fish make it tough on those little skinny necks. He eventually just gave up on it. But the herons weren't the only ones struggling. If you notice in the background, there's an adult bald eagle struggling to carry one of the tilapia away from the pond. And initially, I was wondering why the eagle didn't just eat the meal here at the pond. And then I started thinking about it. It has been nesting season for the eagles, so it's probably trying to carry one back to the nest somewhere. 
So eagles can typically carry up to four or five pounds. So this one must have gotten its hands on one of those bigger ones. But after a few failed attempts, the eagle gave up and flew away. But if you'll notice the timestamp, the eagle came back the very next day, probably after a good night's sleep and it was feeling refreshed and decided to give it another shot. And that's not something you see every day, an eagle dragging a tilapia across a field with the crows trailing right behind. But he was much more determined today to get this one back to the nest and eventually managed to make that happen. But the eagles and herons weren't the only ones enjoying this feast. The buzzards came through in droves. And I thought it was funny that there were tilapia dying all across the pond, but they liked to group up together and fight over the same fish. And the osprey weren't going to miss out on an easy meal. You can see one of them sitting up there on top of the eagle tower. And just like every other species, free meals bring on the competition. Another one swooped in and ran him off. So I've heard these freezing temps have had a negative impact on the crawfish farmers. So I went down to the creek to set some traps to see if I could catch any. And while I was admiring a few of the mud bugs, I heard some loud splashes and grunting. And pretty much everywhere else in the country, the rut has been over for quite a while. But for some reason, our whitetail rut doesn't happen until late January and sometimes even February. And Alabama had to extend its deer season two weeks into February because a lot of the hunters were having to miss out on the rut. But the whitetails will literally run themselves into exhaustion this time of year. And I'm not wearing any camouflage. And I'm pretty sure at some point both of these deer see me because they look right at me. But it's that time of year where they put all caution aside so they can get the job done. So for all you Alabama hunters out there, now's the time to be in the woods. So I just got a package in the mail from YouTube, and if you missed our last video, we passed a million subscribers on New Year's Eve. So again, just wanna say thanks to each and every one of you for making that happen. But now to the bigger question, what should we do with a gold play button? So I wanna hear from you all what you think I should do with it. One idea I had is put it in some sort of enclosure and sink it in our new pond that we call Cedar Falls, or maybe even incorporate it into the waterfall area. But I'm sure you guys can come up with some better ideas, so leave me a comment down below and we'll turn this into a competition. Even if I have to build something, you know we got the talented Mr. Nate Makes that would love to collab with me on it. So leave me those comments down below. I do think it would look pretty cool watching it from the underwater cameras with the fish swimming all around it. And today's video is brought to you by Beam. If you have trouble going to sleep at night, this could be the perfect product for you. Dream is a cup of healthy hot cocoa with five natural sleep ingredients to help you get your best night's sleep. And it targets the four stages of sleep and uses melatonin and magnesium while in stage one, then L-theanine and Reshi help you transition into that deep sleep so you wake up feeling fresh and energized. And it's very simple to make. Just mix one scoop of Dream with milk or water about 30 minutes before bed. And they make the mixing an easy job because they include a frother. And our favorite flavor is mint, but they do have a variety of flavors, including cinnamon cocoa, chocolate peanut butter, and caramel. And with Beam, I feel much more energized in the morning. So if you have trouble waking up and are a little sluggish, I'd highly recommend giving it a shot. Dream has no added sugars and only 15 calories in a single serving. And in a clinical study, 93% of participants reported that Dream helped them get a better night's sleep and they woke up feeling more refreshed. So if you're looking for that high quality sleep, click the link in the video description or scan the QR code and use the code BAMABASS to get up to 35% off. Sleep is important, folks, so it's time to improve the quality of your dreams with Bean. All right, folks, out here at Cedar Falls, and it has been raining all day. We've probably gotten about three inches, but the water's dirty, but it's not nearly as muddy as it was from previous rain, so that's good. But even when it's clear, a lot of the fish that are in here like to hide out in the fish caves. So we're about to go step right over there and catch a couple fish that won't hide. And just a little tip. We're going to be using an ultralight that'll probably tell you what type of fish we're about to catch. <laughs> That's a trout hitting the cork. Got him. What we got here? Yeah, nice bluegill. Like the colors on him. He's got a little purple up there on top. All right. There's one. 
Let's go catch my friend. Oh, this may be a trout because it's fighting like crazy. Oh, that's a huge bluegill. Wow. Alright, that's another really nice one. This one's big. I do like putting some big ones in there. <laughs> so that way the bass won't mess with them. And just like always, we let you name all the pets. So leave me a comment down below for what you think I should name the two bluegills. I asked you to help me name the two rainbow trout. And the first one that I really liked was Mike Trout. And I needed another name to go with it. And Casey said Mike and Molly. So congratulations, Casey. You're the winner of that contest. Send me your address and an email. And now we have a Mike and Molly Trout. <laughs> I like it. So as I mentioned, the cold weathers make the wildlife do some strange things. And I've been seeing the armadillos at a record rate. This one's out here digging up some peanuts from last year's crop. <laughs> and this is that look on his face when he knows he's been caught. And he's just going to try to ease away without being noticed. <laughs> and then it's a full-on sprint. But one thing I didn't know was this armadillo was living underneath the deck on the crimson cabin. And when I spooked him, he went right back to his home <laughs> and tried to tunnel down even deeper. But I talked him into relocating his home. And he said, no problem, I'm out of here. All right, it's too tempting. With all the trout, I had to go grab the rod, catch a couple of them, see if they got any bigger. Got it. <laughs> A little guy. Nice one. Got one. <laughs> this one felt a little better. What that same size. Good little fight. These trout are just thriving out here in this freezing cold water. Everything else got lethargic, not these guys. Nice little rainbow. So I don't know if it was the rutten bucks or the winter storm, but something killed one of our cypress trees we planted last year. So there's only one thing to do, and that's turn it into fish structure. But if I had to guess, it was probably one of the bucks, because you can see anywhere there's an overhanging tree branch, they'll make a scrape right beneath it and then hoof the limbs to add their scent. You can see we got an active scrape right here, and that's how the does and bucks communicate during the rut. So I set up a trail cam so we could get a little closer look into their rutting activities. So here's a prime example of the bucks using the branches as a way of communicating. Sometimes they'll chew on a limb or knock it around with their antlers, but most of the deer that come through the area will smell the branch. You can see another buck coming through with hair standing up on his neck, probably from fighting but it stops by and smells the same branch. And then when a doe is in heat, she'll stop by and pee on the scrape. <laughs> but check out this doe with both ears folded back. And deer aren't the only thing that pee on the scrapes. Got a bobcat stop by to pee on this one. <laughs> Not really sure what all that was about, other than maybe claiming some territory. Got a young buck passing by, and he's on the chase. And our armadillo friend searching for a new home. You can see this doe was passing through and about to smell the branch until she spotted the camera. And we've started seeing a lot more bucks and that's pretty typical during the rut. They're known to travel miles and basically once they get locked onto a doe, they'll follow her wherever she goes. So a lot of the ones we see year round, we haven't been seeing and a lot of new ones passing through. And this buck looks to be a little sore. That's that hobbled run, like he's been running too much lately. So we got a school of bait fish in Cedar Falls. Usually about half of the week, it'll be nice and clear. And the other half, it'll be recovering from a storm. But I'm getting pretty excited because we're only maybe a month or two away from this pond really coming to life. With all those aquatic plants that we planted during the pond build, once we get those lily pads and other blooming plants, it's going to look great. Still, one of my favorite things to do is hang out out here at night. And once we get some clear water and some fish that aren't so shy, it's going to be incredible. There's a good overhead shot showing the fish caves and all the structure in the bottom. And if you look right there in the middle in the deep end, you'll see Mike and Molly Trout. 
But the next day we had another storm come through, dirty the water back up. You can see the raccoons been hanging out here in the beach area. But it's time to stock a thousand golden shiners to make sure Johnny and June and Mike and Molly have plenty to eat. So we're getting them acclimated. And the best part about stocking bait in the cool temperatures is they have a really good survival rate when you compare it to the summertime. And in our last video, we talked about the bass schooling up together and feeding heavily on those threadfin shad this time of year. That's always fun to watch. Now let's see if we can get out and catch a few of them. All right, time to catch some bass, see how big they've gotten. You all know the deal. Every time we catch a bass, we scan it to see if it's been tagged and if it hadn't, we'll add a pit tag and collect all its data. And I really have no clue on what kind of pattern they're on. A few days ago, the weather was in the teens. Today it's 75. And we just got about three inches of rain. So the fish have seen about everything you could see when it comes to weather. So my first catch of the day was pretty unusual because I was fishing off of Alcatraz Island and the first bite I got, I broke it off on a tree right there in the feed trough area. And about 15 minutes later, I cast out there in the same spot and ended up catching the same fish. Because if you look down in his mouth, you can see the worm that broke off. So I decided to try to help this little guy out and get that worm and hook out of there. And I was able to remove it and he even swallowed the weight. So sometimes being an aggressive bass can really pay off. But this particular fish had never been caught before and it weighed in at about a pound and a half. There it goes. <laughs> I hooked that fish right in between the two buoys I got out there. He wrapped me around one of the lines there for a second. It's a nice fish. Watch out for my Christmas trees here. There's a two pounder. Let's see if she's been caught. She has been caught. 570799. And she weighs. 1.96. Alrighty, enjoyed that one. So this fish is named ukulele, and it's the fourth time I've caught it. And this is pretty much exactly what you want to see. Every time you catch the fish, its weight's increasing and continuing to stay aggressive. Oh, he's got me hung. Don't get out of there. There we go. Had to pull him out of the feed trough. It's a nice one. Good fish. Not real fat like the other one's been. Might be a male. All right, this fish has not been caught. This tag is going to be 570878. And it weighs 1.74 pounds. Well, some of them tilapia survived. That's a big one right there. I don't know if he's going to make it, but he's pretty big. Check him out. Jeez. Okay. Little guy hit it right at the island. Little tilapia hanging out right there. And that's been caught before. 571380. 1.14. So this fish is named Karen but I have a feeling Karen is a boy. So it's the third time I caught Karen, but it actually weighed more in August of last year than it does right now. So I have a feeling it's a male that's not really putting on a lot of weight. So we're gonna have to keep a close eye on Karen. And if you missed our video last week, we sank the Christmas tree right here by the island. It was nice to see that they're holding fish. Just barely missed that one. And we finally had another squirrel show up at the peanut picnic table. But this little guy said, wait a minute, this is too good to be true. I'm out of here. But you know squirrels are pack rats for the winter. And it wasn't long before he showed back up. This time he had to take a bite with him. And unfortunately, Mr. Peter Cottontail can't get up on the table. And we got some baby birds up here enjoying the feast. Until Mr. Cardinal stops by, and we got a little bird fight. And this birdie's taking a look and admiring all the options, and decides to go with an apple. And it wouldn't be a feast without our buddy George Jones showing up, and our guy's getting a little old, 
and is struggling to make it up to the top of the table. But eventually he got there. And some whitetails smell it, but they think it's too suspicious and too risky. And there's a cool shot of the cardinal enjoying the sunrise in the morning and telling me it's time to restock the table. And I love seeing the birds get all fluffed out this time of year. And another bird fight. <laughs> this is what a squirrel with anxiety looks like. Looks like he's ready to bolt at any given moment. All right, it's such a nice day today. I went out and caught some blue crabs. We're about to cook them out here on the dock. I'll probably show you guys my recipe. He clamped down on the ice. Also gonna throw the crab shells right here off the dock. They'll sink down to the bottom and probably make a good hard bottom for those bluegills to spawn on in the spring. So as I'm cleaning it out, I just dump everything into the water and the rainbow trout are about to be in for a treat with the crab eggs. But the number one tip for cooking blue crabs is you have to clean them before you cook them. It's just like a fish. You wouldn't want to eat a whole fish without cleaning it. That's what we're going to end up cooking. And the only trick is to make sure you cut off these little tentacles right here. You don't want to eat those. But that's what a clean crab looks like. All right, you just put a little water in the bottom of a pot, sprinkle some seasoning in there. And steaming crabs is one of the easiest things you could ever do. You get them all put into a basket, and as soon as your water starts boiling and you see the steam coming off, you add them in. Sprinkle a little bit more seasoning on top, and then as soon as you start seeing the steam come out of the pot again, set a seven minute timer, and that's it. And blue crabs are pretty easy to catch, and one of the better tasting things out there, so I'd highly recommend trying it out. So now it's time for a taste test. You know, he's gonna give us an honest review. He wasn't sure at first. More? Yeah, more. And so I brought Oliver by the fish tank at Bass Pro Shops. And it was his first time ever seeing a largemouth bass. And let's just say, he was mesmerized. <laughs> he immediately started smiling. And I think we're going to have a little fisherman on our hands. All right, time to feed the deer, and I'm gonna do a little something different today. I've always heard that deer love sweet potatoes. So we're gonna throw some sweet potatoes out, some apples, and maybe even some apple flavored corn, which I know they love. But right here in the middle of the rut, we should see a lot of activity. And we got a couple of bucks squaring up. We may have a fight. Nope, looks like we got some friends here. So at first, they were eating the corn, not really sure what to think about the apples and sweet potatoes. But it didn't take long for them to wipe it all out. And then the rutting continued. So I put out another acorn powder mix, and the young buck we call Spike Lee was the first one to stop by. <laughs> when you watch him eat it in the daytime, it looks like we got a bunch of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And there's one of the young fawns we've been watching all year. He's growing up. But not everyone's so friendly, as this doe was ready to fight. And there's another one of the fawns on the right. You can see the two nubs. So out of those twins, looks like we have one male and one female. The rut's got them acting crazy. <laughs> and all the bucks are choosing to be friendly, rather than violent. Spike Lee found him a new friend. And these are the deer reacting to that bobcat we saw earlier. Can't sneak up on those does. And poor Peter Cottontail missing out on all the food this week. So if you guys recall, we've been seeing a bullfrog in the backyard pond. And I was cleaning the skimmer out and finally caught up to him. And this guy is so big, he could barely roll over. He has done some damage on the Golden Shiner population this past year. And man, look at that chunk. All right, back to the pond you go. Now it's time to feed Mr. Tiger.
All right, folks, that is going to wrap up this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button to follow along with all the pond builds, aggressive bass, and wildlife out here at the farm. Hope y'all enjoyed this one, and we will see you all next time.